Welcome. Hi, I'm Mickey, and this is Wikipedia, where I sit down and chat to doctors, professors, athletes, practitioners, and experts in their fields related to health, nutrition, fitness, and well-being. And I'm delighted that you're here. Hey everyone, it's Mickey here. You're listening to Wikipedia, and guess what? It is our 200th episode. Can't even believe it. I am so stoked to continue to put out information from some of the most awesome people who are out there in the space of health, wellness, nutrition, exercise, activity, all the things. And as a sort of mark of this milestone, this week on Wikipedia, we have Professor Grant Schofield. Those of you who have been listening from Day Dot will or maybe remember that Grant was actually my very first guest on the show. And I am just so stoked to have him here for his fourth time talking about his most recent project, a new book looking at the future of medicine. As always with Grant, this is an informative and informal chat about health, nutrition, lifestyle and wellness with a ton of practical tips that you, the listener, can take away. And, you know, Grant is such a good friend and such a brainiac that this is a very wide-reaching conversation and I think you're really going to enjoy it. I always get great feedback when I have Grant on the show. For those of you unfamiliar with Grant, he is the Professor of Public Health at Auckland University of Technology, Director of the University's Human Potential Centre, former Chief Scientific Advisor to the Ministry of Education in New Zealand. He's also the co-author of four best-selling books and Chief Science Officer for Precure. Can you even believe it? I mean, how does one person do so many things? Professor Grant's career has focused on preventing the diseases of modern times and seeing what it takes to help people live a long, healthy and happy life. He lives and breathes the motto, be the best you can be, and sees this as a game changer for the health system, capable of transforming the current sickness model to one which we aspire to be well. He is redefining public health as the science of human potential and the study of what it takes to have a great life. So Grant is well known for being outspoken and thinking outside the box, challenging conventional wisdom in nutrition and weight loss, as well as physical activity and exercise. He brings his fluency across several scientific disciplines, from human physiology to psychology to peak performance, where in his role at Precure and of course in the university, he delivers world-class training in lifestyle medicine. I have a number of places where you can find Grant in the show notes, including the What The Fat books and his blog, the Human Potential Center at AUT University, and of course, Precure. Before we crack into this conversation, one which I am so stoked I have the ability to bring to you, this is just a reminder, the best way to support the podcast is to hit the subscribe button on your favorite podcast listening platform. That increases the visibility of the podcast out there and amongst the literally thousands of other podcasts there are. So more people get the opportunity to learn from guests that I have on the show, like Professor Grant Schofield. All right, team, enjoy this conversation. Well, Grant, I want to talk to you about your book today. Um, I've hit record, just so you know. Okay. Yeah. And uh, did you know you were the very first guest on Wikipedia? I do. I'm like super stoked about that, especially since this is my favourite podcast name. I get so <laughs> joyous. Wikipedia, it's like the best name for a podcast in the history of podcasts. I know, right? It does sort of afford me a number of acceptances. People are like, I love the name. I'm so coming on. <laughs> <laughs> so you're the first guest. You're the, this is your fourth time on the show. And you're going to be my 200th episode. How's that? Oh, my God. I'm so okay about that. It's 200. Is that right? That's awesome. Way I know. Go you. I know. So good, eh? Um, and generally, when we catch up, we have a ton of things to talk about um, with very little prep required on either end just because you're a good talker. And I can keep up, basically. It's so much fun, isn't it? Like, so much th- to think about. I, yeah, I've been doing this uh, Choose Your Hard book, so I've probably got plenty of 
I've been so deep down rabbit holes, it's really cool. I know, and this is one of the reasons why I want to chat. Firstly, though, I'm just going to go to my little notes. Grant, um, we're going to talk all about your book, but I want to say congrats on that conference. That was awesome. That pre oh, yeah, so Future yeah. of Medicine. Future of Medicine. So, yeah, because so, I, I reckon, like, it's all going to well. We get podcasts from the US and we've got your Peter Tears and your Hubermans and blah, blah, blah. But, like, we're just as good in Australia and New Zealand. We've got awesome yeah. scientists and medical people and practitioners. We've got awesome podcasters, like you and um, Paul Taylor, one he's from across the ditch yes. and you here. Like, just like totally awesome communicators of the science and practice. We've got good practice. So, like we need to, and if we wait for medicine to, change itself into something decent that half resembles anything sensible, well, I, I don't even reckon it'll take 40 years. It'll never no. happen. No, so we've agree. just got to get people going. Yeah, I agree. And do you think, actually, that part of what you were just talking about, like, you know, we always look sort of outside to get, like, the the insights from, um, you know, really well-known people, is that typical New Zealand thing that if you've got an accent or you're from somewhere else, it's got to be better than what we can do here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, when I lived in Australia, I noticed they were slightly better than, that, than us. Like, you know, they'd have the Australian Golf Open. Yeah. And they'd be going, you know, Sanso from Australia is awesome. Oh, amazing. And, uh, yeah, amazing, which is great. You have the, the New Zealand golf and they go, well, we've got Sanso and Sanso and Sanso from, you know, all these other places, not even mention our own guys. It's like, <laughs> come, come on, come on, dudes, let's go. We're, we're actually got some awesome people here. <laughs> totally. But, 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 but totally in this field, our field, yes. that's totally the case. Yeah. And look, let's be fair, you are an absolute thought leader and have been probably your whole career, but of course, I've only known you since, you know, 2007 or whenever we met and you've just been so influential in this field and it just continues, Grant. Like you're not uh, satisfied with starting a training academy, you know, the health coaching, the advanced nutrition certificates, the What the Fat series of books, co-authoring those. You're now, you sort of moved a lot broader, I feel, in, in, in your space, which must feel pretty exciting. I think... Most of it's actually due to a low concentration span and being easily bored, um, <laughs> which in another world would be diagnosed as adult onset ADHD. Yes. So, um, like, I honestly think that is a thing. Um, and if I was pumped into a job that I couldn't move my attention around and um, outsource stuff that I'm hopeless at, like marking or yeah. you know, anything with detail, then, yeah. then you know, I could be quite a useless human being. Um, and so I'm less useless because of the place I work. It's really interesting because I've been really down on the uni, mm. and, and I wrote a big essay about that recently. You know, falling in love with the uni, and yeah, it, it shouldn't everything. But then, like a few things happened to me. I was like, oh, I'm quitting this place. It's awful. You know, like there's um, can't stand the bureaucracy, all this sort of stuff. And then straight away that night, I went to Costco and. I said I was just looking at a guy walk past me pulling a trolley same age as me. It's like, oh shit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's a bit awkward. But then also I went to um Paul Taylor's talk at that conference. I thought was outstanding, good communicator. Hell yeah. Um and the stuff on stoicism and zone one, zone two, and it's like, you know, be the be the person you want to be. And then I thought that was good. But then I went out for dinner that Sunday with the chair of our board at Pre Cure, and he was like, Oh, I really like that talk by Paul Taylor, and this guy Bennett's like an absolute friggin' star, you know, like he's an older business guy, you know, really, you know, done well in his own businesses and everything. And he's like, oh, it really stuck in my mind that, you know, be the person you want to be and everything will come right. And I was like, think about that. Then my uh, youngest son, Danny, who's 13, went at hockey and he was completely losing his shit, like throwing his stick, at, you know, swearing and carrying on. Eventually got sent off. And I'm just going, shit. He can't do that. Hang on. We need a bit of a reset here in the Schofield family, yes. including me. And so I I, I, I promise you the story's going somewhere. <laughs> so then, then I went back and I and I watched The Matrix, 1999 movie The Matrix. Do you remember that? Yes. And, and in that there's a scene where Neo, who's Keanu Reeves, goes to meet the Oracle and he goes in and there's a little boy sitting there just up as a Buddhist monk and he's bending a spoon with his mind. And he, he says, you know, the trick to bending the spoon, Neo? And he's like, no. He goes, the trick to bending the spoon is that there is no spoon. 
And, and then it all clicked for me at once. I was like, oh, my God, I've been mentoring people for my whole life that you just need to ignore the bureaucracy, bend reality to yourself, not yourself to reality. And, and so I, I went into my office the next day at the uni. I wrote on the wall, there is no spoon. And then under that, I wrote, be the professor you want to be in the university that you think you'd like to be in. Nice, and, Grant. And it's like a massive turning point for me from being – down in the doldrums about how um, you know shit COVID was, and uh, you know a government sucks, and uh, universities are not what they used to be, and all that. So I'm, I'm back on a, a full firing state of actually might as well bend reality to suit us rather than the other way around. That's awesome. We talk. I'm sure that we've had discussions around either it's, or certainly in person, but on the podcast as well about just the importance of mindset, right? Like yeah. that literally changes everything around you uh, or the perception because it, it, does, it, it doesn't, it, but it does. No, it does. It actually f- does actually change the world around you yeah. Um, by you willing it to be so rather than the other way around. Yes. Because the, the other way, and I'm, I'm not demeaning the guy at Costco, he might be having a great life, but I can't imagine he's got quite as much agency as I have. Yeah, interesting. Or yeah. yeah, do you know? Because my dad, you know, my dad's a cleaner, right? Yeah. And uh, and he's like seventy, so he cleans full time um, and also gets pension, which is actually brilliant. Uh, yeah. And he is perfectly happy in his. He's got as much agency as he would ever want because because he goes to work, he does his job, he comes home, and then his time is his own, right? So mm. maybe the guy at Costco is a bit the same. Yeah, yeah, maybe I'm just. Jumping to conclusions, yeah, why was me? Yeah, <laughs> hey, um, that um, that's that's a really good um uh, point you bring up about you know be the person you want to be. Like, have you read Richard Wiseman's As If Principle? Uh, no, I haven't heard of that. Tell me about that. Yeah, so it's this. It's basically a book. That, I mean, as the uh, name um, suggests, Goes. yeah, it's you act as if you're the person that you want to be. So that's sort yeah. of what it is. And then the whole book itself is is looking at research around this concept and where it's successful and how you can use it in terms of your diet, exercise, and just you know the big sort of pillars in life. And I'm pretty sure it was in this book they discuss this study that this woman. Uh, conducted where she took a bunch of 80 year olds and she took them back. Oh yeah. Yeah. I know that. So you know that's this. awesome. Yes. Yes. And so they lived for a week with, with um, the, and basically back in when they were like, I don't know, 30 or something and they had everything like the TV shows well, probably wasn't any TV, um, you know, pictures and everything changed. Like the, the biological markers changed because they, they just, thought themselves younger, essentially, which I thought was amazing. It's awesome. I, I did try that this week with running, to be honest, Mickey. <laughs> I was like, you're a runner again. You're a runner. And Ooh. so I ran eight days in a row, and then I got an Achilles injury. Well, you're a runner. That's exactly, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's exactly what happens to a runner. <laughs> that's awesome, Grant, because this time last year, we were running together in Kona. Oh, yeah, we were. That was awesome. Missing that. That was amazing. We're just going to have to wait till next year, obviously, for yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Grant, first of all, your talk at the Precure conference, am I right in thinking that it will be released to the public sooner or later? I'm, I'm trying to – yeah, yeah the, so the Precure talks are all coming out, including your one, in, uh, in due course. So the very first one is we released with Dr. Matt Phillips. Amazing. Uh, so that's out on the Future of Medicine site for free, so everyone can just go and look at that. But uh, should we talk about that one for a start? Like, yeah, let's. Friggin' heck, that was – so, yeah, speaking of superstars, neurologist Dr. Matt Phillips, I don't know if people have heard of him, but – Well, you know, he was on your show, and then because he was on your show, he came on my show. Oh, you've had him, yeah. So you, yes. people, Wikipedia listeners will know all about him. Yes. I mean, what a superstar of a guy – um, and he's on a you know, sort of third clinical trial, that one with the Alzheimer's that he managed to push things back, um, first time ever. Yeah, amazing. And the one with uh, Parkinson's where he managed to push things back, first time ever. Yes. Um, and now this first trial with this nasty disease that I didn't know much about, but this glioblastoma multiform aggressive brain cancer. Wow. And But he, you know, these protocols are pretty, uh, how would you say, like the, the challenging protocols. I guess the the conditions themselves demand it, right? 
you got like fatal brain cancer months yeah. to live, and and now you're asked to put a sort of five day fast yep. every month, and then uh, not outside of that time a one metal day keto. Yep. Um, but then a remission, regression and remission in some cases of the of the otherwise untreatable brain cancer. Yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would hope that I would be motivated enough to do that if I was in that situation. It's, I've been struggling with this whole thing though, and everything, and I'm struggling with this book I'm writing at the moment. Uh, and you, you'll have thoughts on this, right? About minimum effective dose advice versus optimal advice. And, and I'd be really interested to see what you think about this because I reckon there's a few things going on here that we could consider, right? So, first of all, there's this idea that people have different personalities. So, some people are, you know, low need for cognition, and some people will be describing themselves as satisficers versus. Other people are maximizers. You know, they're just diff- people would want to know all the information. Mm-hmm. Um, and anything about something like physical activity guidelines, you know, I mean, the bar's so low, you can step over it with gumboots on. Um, yeah, 30 minutes or something a day, gardening counts. You know, you must as well be vacuuming the house, making it counts. Yeah. You know, for, for us, we would, I suppose, if we went and did that, just that, we would go backwards. We would devolve uh, our condition. Yet half the population doesn't achieve that, so mm. maybe that's the best place to start. Um, on the other hand, you know, the optimal advice, or, you know, strength training, you know, zone two this and uh, functional movement that, you know, it's quite demanding and maybe aspirational for most people. But, you know, on the other hand, and, and it could be confusing, there's evidence from marketing, the more choice you give people, the worse it is, you know, just do this one thing and that, that way. But, you know, if you've got sick with cancer, you know, just go, oh, well, there's a bunch of different chemos we could give you, sort of all do it, but just, you know, see whatever's left on the day. Mm. You know, you're going to go, no, shit, I want the best possible advice here. Yeah, yeah. What do you make of all that? Well, I think you raise a couple of good points. The first one is that um, the minimum effective dose, right, so let's say physical activity is such a good example because I often think about this, is that the guidelines, the bar is so low that I wonder whether people don't even bother because of that. You know, like <laughs> like it's like, well, if that's all it takes, well, how important is it really? And yeah. I'm sort of almost there, you know. Okay, good point. Good yeah, point. this good is what I'm that. thinking. Um, and then... Uh, and then as you were talking, I was just also thinking about something else which Cam talks about a little bit around people's motivations to achieve um, those optimal, you know, optimal health or feel your best self or be a better version of yourself and that kind of thing. Mm. Despite the fact, this is a little bit of a tangent actually, but despite the fact that they could feel a whole lot better and in this particular moment, they're feeling terrible, their energy is low, they're fl- feeling sluggish, cognitively they've got brain fog, that's actually a comfortable place for them to be. And we assume that people always want to feel better, but actually people just want to feel comfortable. Yeah, sort of anti-hormetic yes. advice, right? Yes. And so people just, you know, people like, so when it comes to, um, you know, knowing or understanding risk, that's just sort of part of people's motivation to get better or be better. But it's actually, you know, how big is, how, how strong is the pull of feeling comfortable and being in the familiar? Like, I think that's interesting. Yeah. And it's sort of a slippery slope, right? Because the, the, the less, and we even know this from ourselves, you know, you, you probably had it when you had your f- uh, fracture. Yes. That as you get less fit and, Less you're doing less stuff, it becomes even easier to do less stuff. Yes, and you almost feel proud. It's like, oh, sweet! Look at what I'm getting away with. <laughs> yeah, and then 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 eventually, when you have to get back to what you were normally doing, it actually seems you know sort of a bit daunting and insurmountable. <laughs> yeah, that is and, so and true. That's us. Yeah, I know. Uh, that, I know. And actually, Grant, you're a good person to ask about this because we're very similar. And I've just been reflecting on the six months I had this year where I was unable to run. And that was a first in a while that had been that long. Like I'm talking years. And I thought I had reached this place where I was, as you were just talking, you know, fairly happy with where I was at doing my strength training three times a week, walking, that kind of thing. But then I started running again and was able to run. And I just realize I was a version of myself for the first six months and now I'm truly back to feeling awesome you know because I'm able to run and you 
I feel like you've been in a similar position across your years. You know, you've had periods of time where you haven't run um, yet. Of course, you've gone on and done other things, but do you feel your best when you're at your fittest? Like, oh, hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, there's just no doubt about that. Yeah, that, that fitness is yeah medicine in the best possible kind of way. And I just you know feel like I want to aspire to be the best fittest I can as I, especially as I age. But I don't know, you know, like. Uh, is that just prioritizing that above? Am I missing out on other important things, or am I just stupid about it? Well, I think the evidence is like strong for fitness, but oh yeah, uh, yeah. I think I presented some of those data from that uh, JAMA study with the hundred and fifty odd thousand people they followed with cardiovascular fitness for f- until death. Yes, and and you know, gosh, the, the highest ten percent of fitness that sort of fitness category that you and I would probably fall into. I mean, they're five times lower chance of dying of anything, and. I, th- I think you know when you compare it with other serious medical conditions like diabetes and smoking, one point four times. Yes. End stage renal disease, two point four times. Like bloody hell! Like there's massive, massive uh, benefits of fitness as, as as a medicine in society. And so is that I mean, I suppose dying you won't know. So yeah, it's um, true. But <laughs> uh, the the yeah everything else. I, I can't imagine. I'm trying to do this thing at the moment because I'm writing this book I've tried to do that and I've got a bit of I'm away on a writing retreat I'm trying to do this this algorithm type based thing so I get everything in a good life so I was like 24 hours in the day and I made up this thing called eight seven six three so eight hours sleep seven hours focus work which is you know virtually as much as I can handle six hours is just random stuff like cooking chilling children there's no commuting here but you know just doing whatever I feel like. And yeah. there's still three hours left to do health and exercise. So, I, you know, I get up in the morning, take the dog for an hour and a half walk. Yep. And then when I knock off tonight, I'll probably go on the bike for an hour and I'll have the sauna going after that and I'll go on that. And it's like three hours worth of stuff, it just seems. Yeah. Um, I mean, and that's a privileged position, but still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sort of, it's, it, so with your algorithm then, is that something which you're sort of putting in as a, I mean, I guess people forget how much time they've got in the day, right? Well, I, I, I was astonished, even after 25 years of studying this, when I just tried to think about that for myself. Yeah. I still had six hours left to do whatever I wanted, and I still had three hours to do health and other stuff. Yeah. And, and okay, well, it was only seven hours of work, not 10. But even if I did 10, I'd still have three and three or four and one or two or something. You know, like it just seems to me that, you know, the major barrier is perceived rather than real. And then with that then, Grant, because I know that people will push back at this and go, yeah, but your kids are growing up or getting there. Maybe you've got less of that hands-on time that they might have with their toddlers. How Would you change the algorithm to... Yeah, you, you, you might need to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That'd be quite and good it's particularly bad if you're a solo parent. Yes. That's, that re- really sucks for that. But if you've, there's two of you and um, dealing with, even with young kids and we've all been there, you've still got... You know, twelve hours between you. Yeah, yeah. So, so I don't know, and, and other people have a, you know, a bit more commuting. They have to work into that six hours. Uh, then they might have to work more than seven hours. They're less fortunate than me, and you know they have to do nine hours or whatever. But you know, there'll be an algorithm for you that that might help. Yeah, yeah. You know, what, what's your what's your algorithm? What's your algorithm? Do you reckon? So, uh, in so normally nine till about. Five would be in bed, so what's that? Eight hours, not necessarily eight hours sleep, but my sleep is definitely. I probably, I, I probably average seven to seven and a half most yeah. nights, which is pretty but good. Eight hours opportunity. Yeah, 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 yeah. Work. Well, it really depends, you know. Like I think about seven hours. I think, God, do I do seven hours work? Like sometimes it feels like I get on at seven, I'm working, and then I finish at eight p.m. You know, so it's like a long day, but I'm not working the entire day. So I think because of the work I do, it's a real blend of that sort of seven and six probably together. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be too different from you. And do you know what? I think it's because I would, I would, I prioritize training above most other things. That's why I get up at 4.30 or 5 a.m. because I know that I've got clients at 7 or 8 and I definitely want to do that swim and that run or that strength and that whatever. So I'm going to yeah. fit it in. So so I'm probably not too And you, you have got quite a busy job, to be fair. And yeah, also the the sort of legendary um, support that you give your um, clients yes. is fairly time-consuming, right? It is. It is. But And it's funny, actually, because I love it. Like it doesn't – and I guess it's – 
it doesn't feel like work, I suppose. And maybe that's where I then yeah, am kind of like, is that, you know, I feel like I'm um, being sneaky on Facebook where I should be working, but actually I'm on Facebook doing my job. You know, it's a funny thing, isn't it? Like, Yeah, you don't want to think you're doing your job too much because then it might seem like like work. Yes, <laughs> yeah, totally, <laughs> totally. Yeah. yeah, and I don't want it to seem like I never work, but sometimes I'm like, actually, this is work. That's right, you forget. But um, I think I'd be very similar to you, Grant. Speaking of your book, do you want to tell us a little bit about it, the premise? And let's go into some of the sort of major pillars. Oh, yeah. There's really one I want to talk about with you because I think you're the only one who'll get it. Yeah, okay. Um, so so I had these – first of all, I've just been thinking about the mismatches in yeah, physiology and psychology in the world. And the physical ones are pretty obvious, so we don't have to cover those too much. Like the movement mismatch, like we sit around far too much. Um, the The – Food mismatch, my God, you know, with ultra processed food that people chuck into their into their uh, chompers and away they go. Um, the the light mismatch that we, you know, we're sitting, we don't have anything that resembles camping. Yes. Uh, so the, 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 those sort of obvious ones, the temperature mismatch that we're you know very comfortable at even temperature, and then we've ended up mouth breathing as well. I suppose as a as a physical one. So those are all big interesting things, but the social ones are way more interesting. Um, so, so it turns out these these social psychologists that talk about the social mismatches that we've got, and, the, and their first one, they, so they first of all they talk about weird environments, right? So their current environment's weird, and so weird stands for Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic, yeah, you know, which it all sounds good, yeah, yeah, um, but actually doesn't resemble anything like how humans have lived, um, and that sort of stuff. Uh, but they they go on to to make another acronym. The rest of the acronym is called strangely weird, which is I, I just love. Hang on, I'm just going to find the actual full acronym. Yeah. Uh, the strangely weird thing is so funny. So strangely, um, first of all, we've got uh, S. So there's social media, which is a weird thing, right? For a start, um, it, it, people have the most social media have the least actual friends and are the loneliest. So that's just a weird thing, the sort of social connection you get through. I defriended someone the other day because I walked past them in the hallway at the uni and they didn't say hi. And I was like, we can't say hi in reality. What the hell? Yeah, true. So so social media, that's, that's, that's the first one. Um, uh, T, engage in temporary relationships. So temporary relationships in, in humanity have never been a thing. So that's a really interesting thing. Um, uh, uh, ah, relocate with relative ease. That's never been a thing in human history that we could just move from, you know, Seattle to San Francisco or New York or Invercargill to Auckland or something. It's just not a thing. Um, have autonomy and make choice. This, this is just a fascinating thing that in countries where there's arranged relationships, not love made ones, they're more robust, they last longer, and people are happier. Interesting. It's like I'm not saying we should all rush off and do that. Yeah, yeah. I'm not really for it myself, but it's just an interesting idea. Yeah. Um, okay, here's a new word for you. Uh, Nully Paris. Um, so that I means know that, that. What is that? Isn't that something to do with pregnancy? Yeah, so you can go your whole life without having a pregnancy, yes. which that, that could be you. So I'm not saying. Um, <laughs> In fact, it is. <laughs> but but you've, you've ended up with a family anyway. But, yes. But the fact that that. As even a thing was like, you know, historically it's just not possible. Yeah. Um, experience social group segmentation. So you can be in quite specialised bits of society is a really interesting thing. Um, uh, being tested in an educational setting, especially universities, they have no actual relationship to the real world. That's but that's where you're you're um, that's where you're judged on, or just sort of spelling mistake. Uh, so unusual uh, for you, Grant. <laughs> um, have lots of options, like you can be whatever you want to be, all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, you didn't have that option in small societies. Um, and this last one's a classic: a young adults. For, and you'll you'll like this from I know your social situation at home. Um, you have, we have such a thing as young adults now. Yes, in you so, talking, so, so, yes. So so adults that are young people that live at home, yep. still with their parents, um, and. Like it's there was no such thing historically. Like they they were out, you know, behaving like adults. So my kids tell me they're staying for at least another ten years. <laughs> Does it fill you with a little bit of like, oh my god, fear or joy? Well, Sam's Sam's not going to like me saying this, but um, I, there's a few things. So he said, "Oh, we're going to charge you rent." Like he's got a full time job, he earns a decent yeah. salary. Yeah. So it's going to be two hundred bucks a week. You know, lives in Takapuna, and you know. Wealthy suburb in Auckland, he gets all his food, which he'd eat more than 200 bucks a week from anyway. 
you know, internet, power, you know, the whole box of dice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and he's, he said to Louise, oh, Dad keeps coming into my room, Mum, and leaving stuff. <laughs> what? She's like, oh, okay, well, that sounds a bit weird. Let me talk about that. Yeah, he just comes in and puts stuff down. Turns out it's his fold of washing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then he's like, oh, oh you're, you're charging me market rent. It's obscene. Um, I'm, I'm moving out. We're like, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, Go out and <laughs> see how much you're really going to be charged when you get out. So he was, going to be, he was going to be charged that amount, but he f- found some mates who live in Nile Road, which is what got flooded in Milford. Yeah. Um, but the house was yellow stick and, and, and he went down there with his mates, but they hadn't even bothered to put the power on. So... He he was like decided he wasn't going there in the end, so he came back with <laughs> tail between his legs. Then, <laughs> then we hear these, uh, you know, then, then we're lying in bed the other night and we hear them going, oh, you know, they're on their second meal of the night. We've cooked a full family meal, right? Protein and everything. And then it's nine o'clock, so they're making another one probably with tomorrow night's dinner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A- and we hear them talking and, and they're going, oh, hardly worth working. <laughs> we're like, oh, yeah, what's that? They go, oh, and he's like, oh, we're just overhearing that. Texas going, what's that? He goes, oh, well, I'm only on effectively on $19 an hour. And we're like, oh, yeah, well, I wonder what that is. And he goes, oh, well, by the time you take out rent and, you know, golf fees and petrol, yeah, I only really get 19 bucks an hour. <laughs> that is <laughs> hilarious, Grant. So, so that is the why of young adults. So, yes. That the, so, but but the, the point of that whole um, strangely weird is there's this massive mismatch between the sort of social situation, especially for our young people that they live in now. Um, and, and, you know, it's not entirely their own fault, right? Or it's mostly not their own fault. I mean, I'm sure you'd much rather go and buy a house and live there you know, and, and, you know, do all that stuff, but that's not the way the world's constructed. It's just not feasible that he could go and find uh, and, you know, get accommodation on his own or with other people that were similar. Um, and st- you know, so we've created a social situation where, especially for young people, they're in a completely different situation than what the species has been in for the whole time they've been on the planet. So that's a, that's been an interesting thing. Um, I suppose the other thing that that's I think many of the people on your podcast will be really familiar with, but I, I just hadn't got the full implications of it is the what I'm calling the pleasure mismatch. Okay. And and so the pleasure mismatch is really that. Yeah, some things call, cause pleasure, like, you know, pet the dog, go for a run, eat, eat, eat a meal, kiss your wife, husband, whatever. Um, yeah. And those are all within sort of biological limits, and, and that raises dopamine. Dopamine is not so much pleasure, but motivation, you know, attentiveness. You know, it's, it's an important part of that motivational um, milieu, um, and so there's a reason to do it again. Uh, then you start to introduce some of the things that raise dopamine now, you know, both chronically and really highly. And the, the three that have really stuck in my mind are uh, vaping, uh, because the nicotine raises dopamine massively. And of course, the biological response to that super normal raising is that now you've got dopamine that down regulates. So basal dopamine drops. And drops in basal dopamine doesn't mean less motivation, it means more pain. Oh, it interesting. Hurts. Okay, yeah. Um, psychological pain. And that can be relieved by getting dopamine back up again, but it gets harder and harder. And eventually, you know, like a smoker, a vapor is vaping just to get the dopamine back to baseline, like what you and me are sitting at now. Um, so it, 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 plummets, it plummets pleasure, but it, it delivers the exact opposite. Um, and, and, of course, the problem with, with vaping is, uh, over and above smoking is that you can just get more nicotine for longer. Um, I mean, it's not saying smoking's any good either. There's dozens of other reasons that's bad. So there's that. But then all, gaming does the same thing. Gaming does a very similar thing. It's very much designed to elevate dopamine, keeping up for long periods of time. Um, and and so does social media. So studies of people, the more they use social media, um, then you know, not, not for work like you do, but for, for those things, the lower their baseline dopamine. And so the lower your baseline dopamine, now things like, Petting the dog, eating a healthy meal, going for a run, they don't raise dopamine even back to baseline. And that, that state's called adhedonia, inability to feel basic pleasures. And I think the most obvious thing to me that was my son Danny. If you give him unrestricted use of gaming, he doesn't want to exercise anymore. The only food he wants to eat is junk food, if at all. 
um, and he doesn't enjoy school or getting good grades at school or anything. And if you ban him from that, which is an absolute shit fight, um, then everything just returns to the normal boy who can experience normal things. And you know, in many ways, I I'm surprised our mental health of our young people. It's really bad. Like I think yeah. one of the main statistics that stands in my mind is that, and so quickly in 2010, he said on Health Survey, psychological distress measured by the K10 was 5.6 percent for our. Uh, 16 to 24 year olds, these big national survey. In 2021, it was just under 25% for the same age group. Wow. Uh, it's an astonishing do change. We, do we have any like statistics? Because obviously, 2021 post COVID, would that, how much of that would have, yeah, it, it, it could have been, but, yeah. but to be fair, it was trending steadily upwards across the other two surveys that occurred between there anyway. So, yeah, yeah, yeah COVID could have ex- indeed have exacerbated it and it could blip down again, but you know. Yeah. Nonetheless, that's what it is, and it was going upwards. Well, that's interesting, Grant. So a couple of things. My first um, uh, question is, well, not question, but you you mentioned it, so obviously it's a thing that can happen. Like you can reverse the shift in dopamine. Like how easy, like with Danny, for example, and his gaming, just to remove it, you're going to get that with that pain first, but over time he just sort of reverts back to his normal um, normal sort of self. Is that something that you can expect with everyone in that sort of situation? Yeah, right. so uh, that's uh, Anna Lemke, the Harvard psychiatrist, um, Dopamine Nation book and the Dopamine Fasting. Yeah, that's and, right. And she's way for that. She's just like, stop, reset. And it's very different than the harm minimization approach to addictions and um, those types of behaviors that we've taken. You know, you're an alcoholic for life, you know, you've got a gaming addiction, you know, blah, 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 these things. Um, or, you know, you're an alcoholic, just do these things, just like stop, reset the system. It's it's Rather than thinking about this as pathology, it's 100% normal biology, but just just unfortunately hacked by an environment that doesn't match. You know, so, and I much prefer to think about it that way. Yeah. that's So my brother used to be so addicted to gaming. He would game all of the time. And the thing that saved him was golf. And it's, I don't know what happened and how it happened, but he discovered golf and now he spends all his time golfing. But, and, and you know, it's sort of like switching, uh, like switching out one thing for the other. But I have to say, like the impact of golf, like as he's socializing with his friends, he's outside, he's getting that low level activity that golf provides and it motivates him to get into the gym to be strong, to be better at golf or whatever you need to be better at golf. You know, so it just, the the outcome of his behavior change, despite the fact that it's, like some might say he's a bit obsessed with, obsessed with golf now and I'd probably agree, but it's just, it's got to be better. Yeah. And, and I suppose the other good thing about that is, of course, is that yeah, golf probably does increase your dopamine and all those things, but it does within normal levels. Yeah, good call. Yes. And yeah, so yeah. he's not. So now he can feel pleasure from all the other things in life that he probably couldn't. I, 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 I honestly just go. I, I would expect our mental health to be even worse. Yeah, interesting. Um, under these conditions for our young people, I mean, what a struggle. I'm glad we grew up not in that era. Yeah. Do you think it's just that we're more resilient than we give ourselves credit for? Yeah, maybe, but we're still. Could do better, you know. Like, yeah. Um. Yeah. So another question. You know, Rich Roll talks about this a bit in his podcast, and you know, he was he was addicted to drugs and alcohol. He got off that, and then he found endurance sport. And now people criticise him for being addicted to endurance sport. But I mean, you and I are both on the probably on the cusp of potentially being described the same the same way. Like you know, we're addicted to the um the what we get from exercise, but again. That's way better than being addicted to drugs or alcohol. Like, is it just swapping one bad thing for another? Yeah, well, I suppose you've got to look at the um, net harms versus benefits. And, you know, as soon as the harms outweigh the benefits, you're in big trouble, aren't you? And I yeah. Think, um, I, I'd argue, at least for you and me, that, that yeah, there, there may be some minor harms from, from you know, really prioritising exercise over a lot of other things. But in the end... Um, those benefits, at least in my mind, trump any harms by miles. Whereas I can't imagine if I just drank booze all the time, <laughs> there'd be a bunch of evidence of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
no, I, I, I totally appreciate that. Um, also, that that whole social aspect, that whole social thing, is super interesting. In your book, are you going to cover off what now? Because I mean, these are oh, yeah. these well, are the, our what, realities. What, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so uh, all those mismatches are all very interesting. That's right. But the the whole second half, I'm I've tried to I don't know if it's going to work, but I'm tried to make this periodic table looking thing of eight things. Oh, cool. That I call essential elements. And uh, um, so in there's the uh, fitness is medicine, food is medicine. Uh, I've actually got time is medicine with the algorithm stuff that I talked about. Uh, breathing is medicine. Temperature is medicine. Uh, thinking is medicine. I've also had excitement is medicine and light is medicine. So I think these are all of the um, behavioral techniques that I'm aware of um, that you know, start at, at a minimum effective dose and build to some complexity for uh, peak performance. And you know, like you're not going to engage in all of them um, in the way that you know I do, um, but it gives a little roadmap of different things that are interesting. And I think the world's changing so fast. You know, I've learned so much, especially in the last ten years, about things that I never intended to. I, I would have never thought that I would be spending twelve thousand dollars a sauna and have a chest freezer in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> like damn who it, would have, who would have thought that was in a I yeah. damn it. I thought it was going to be a bit cheaper. I, was, I had it on my no, Christmas not, list. <laughs> well, that's not even counting the fact that um, even when you've got it there, it's in a freaking kit set. <laughs> which you've got zero chance of putting it together yourself. And then, so you have to get someone to do that. And then you have to get it widened. But no, 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 no. It's not, it can't connect to the normal mains. It can't just plug in. It's got to be wired with a special heavy duty cord that's got to come direct from some, you know, so $2,000 later there. But well worth it, isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so it got distracted there. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's all good. Because I actually was going to ask you about the sauna because I often think about the sauna when I think about um, when people talk about endorphins, you know, um, which you didn't at all mention, but that's where my head was going. We we're talking about sort of pleasure seeking and, and feeling happy and the fact that the sauna, and you must, do you have this in your book about the, the dynorphins? I haven't, I haven't actually written the heat section yet. Um, I think I just mentioned before we got going that I'm on 40,000, 49,000 or something words. Yes. Um, and I'm still making my way to the heat. Well, is you, can, is medicine section. you can um, have the transcript of our talk if you like, and I'll do the next 280 for you. <laughs> 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 but so with the sauna, like one of the, um, the reasons why it's uh, one of the, uh, what science suggests is that it, changes how our brain responds in the with the heat it releases uh the heat releases something called our dynorphins which are the opposite of the endorphins yeah which cause pain and discomfort and you're uncomfortable but what that then does is outside of sauna time the things that give you pleasure um give you an elevated sense of pleasure and joy so in fact oh, i've got to get into that i, I actually yes. didn't know about that mechanism yeah um, I'm all over the you know, the myokines and the fluid volume and the heat shock proteins, but I've got to get into that. Yes. Is that right? That's cool. Yeah, it's so cool. I'll send you a link. I'm sure it must have been Rhonda Patrick that I um, heard that from because she, as you know, she's like, she knows almost everything about the sauna. Oh, so that really fits into the whole choose your hard theme, right? So you're actually like temporarily hurting yourself slightly. Yes, yes. But uh, for the ultimate gain of being happier overall. Is that true, true of hard exercise as well, I wonder? Ah, oh, I don't know, Grant. I reckon that's something else that you need to add to your thing to add us, ChatGPT. Oh, oh, okay, I'm all over that. Who knows what you learn off the Wikipedia podcast? <laughs> I they, know. <laughs> they, okay, that's cool. That's yeah. cool. Um, but, but the sort of thing, like, honestly, I think we'd have um, 300 saunas a year. Oh, yeah, uh, amazing. So um, it's just quite a habit. The other good thing about a sauna that's just not discussed, that is nothing physiological, is that, yeah, you, know, you get the family in there in the evening, and you're talking to each other. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this what else are you going to do? It's like a, this, you're not on your device. Or we've got one of the steam type ones. You're not taking your phone in there to get completely baked. Um, so that, that's a, a massive unexpected benefit. Um, for sure. For, and for where us. does that fit in your table? Your elements table, like the social aspect, the the relationships, that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I think I, didn't, I was originally going to have one called Friends Are Medicine. Um, until I realised that actually pretty much all of the things have that involved, right? So if you're, you're exercising and being fit, that like outdoors with other people, it's, that's obviously the setting. Uh, you know, food, like what do you sit down there, eat 
you know, perfectly constructed nutritional meal by yourself. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are people uh, that do that. There are yeah, some, right, I but, but I can't of... imagine that's so good. No. Um, and then, you know, across all of, the, all of these things, um, other people being involved is like, a, a critical thing. You know, I was just also reading a study this morning. I want to tell you about this study. This is a, a, an interesting study. It'd be interesting to see what you think about it. It sort of sucks you, you and me who are working a bit by ourselves at, at home often. Yeah. Is um, they did this trial in a workplace where they got people moving around the office and they looked at their performance. And when they're in within 25 feet of a low performer, their own performance dropped by 15%. And when they're within 25 feet of a high performer, their own performance went up uh, 30%. I 100% buy into that. I've been in job settings where I, I'm sitting there, I'm doing my job and I'm feeling very, like I'm not doing it, like I feel like this unproductive, not doing much. Then I look around me, everyone else is doing this. And then I'm like, sweet. <laughs> and, <laughs> and even more so, then I'm called into the boss's office and I'm told what an amazing job I'm doing. Like, <laughs> and, and, and actually... All you're doing is bringing everyone else down. No, no, they're bringing me down. But oh, but, I see. Yes. Yeah, I get it. Okay. Yes. Right. I, so I'm hey, like, so oh. but, but 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 what you so what if you're at home though working and Barry's there? Yeah. You need Barry to be within 25 feet. Measure it out. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> he's a good worker, Barry. He gets he gets stuff done. He gets stuff done. Um, yeah, yeah. You're a bit lift you. Yeah, but I so you know like there's and actually there's nothing worse than feeling like you're not doing a good job. Actually, yeah. and you're getting away with it. I don't feel good about that at all. In fact, it's demotivating and it's a bit depressing. So to be in a, a like a uh, high performance environment, I can so see why that's going to be beneficial for your performance. Yeah, you know that's back to the the friends are medicine thing. I suppose the other thing is that we're all all wired. That's evolutionary conserved thing of those mirror neurons, right? We're, we're supposed yes. to work in small groups. And when someone someone hurts, you hurt. When they're happy, you're happy. Obviously, not as much, but it's it's an effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and and the fact that dogs share those same mirror neurons as humans is like a cool thing. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. So, um, so Grant, on your book, then, so you're at forty nine thousand. Uh, what is that? Nine hundred and no, seven hundred and twelve. Seven hundred and twelve words. Uh, when when are you? What, what's your sort of release date for this? We oh, I was thinking, wait, wait. yeah, early next year because I told me actually, like, I don't know how many it's going to end up being. Could be end up eighty thousand, I suppose. And then you got to get someone to edit it so it actually makes sense and it's readable. And so, yeah, uh, who knows? Yeah, but, yeah, that's awesome. Now let's talk about nutrition because I know you're big on nutrition. Maybe not as big as what you were because we all have our evolution of thoughts and and the importance of all these things. Um, where are you at with seed oils? Oh yeah, so I've just written on written a whole section on that. I've done this. Oh, amazing. I've been writing a nutrition section. So I wrote um, nutrition controversies section. So I did um, saturated fat and seed oils all in one section, and then I did uh, salt and uh, fiber. Awesome. And so I think on the fats, it's interesting. You know, they they started. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. They started. You know, you can measure. The fatty acid composition of your fat cells. Yeah, and if you start measuring that at about 1950, we're about the same as a chimpanzee um, in the ratio of omega six, omega threes, and it's just tracked linearly upwards. Uh, you know, over the last 70 years, um, so now that it's a completely different shape, and so I suppose if I talk about seed oils, I'm specifically talking about linoleic acid. Yeah. Yeah, and um, and where do we find that, Grant? It's in uh, it's in all sorts of oils. It's in a little bit in all just about all oils, but it's um, higher in things like corn oil, safflower oil. Um, yeah, canola is probably half and fifty percent. So between fifty and seventy percent of the high ones that you, people would call industrial seed oils, I suppose is what they want to call them. But these are manufactured oils, probably generally unstable. Um, I think on first principles, you go well. Uh, there's a, a bent polyunsaturated bond, and that's why these things don't fit together at room temperature. That's why they're not like butter or coconut oil or lard. They don't not straight carbon. They just they're not they're floating around in things. And, and is that molecule easily broken and oxidized? I reckon the answer is absolutely it is. So it's a more easily oxidized oil. And then you go, and there's such a zeitgeist of epidemiology around. Around this, and I've been following this on Twitter or X or whatever it's called recently. And there's been a bit of a fight about Huberman's put out, 
you know, seed oil is bad for you. And I think um, there's been that lane Norton's been going, oh, they're nothing but good. And others have been piping. I don't know if you've observed any of that. Yeah, but, I have. Uh, so, uh, um, partially what motivated me to get back into the data. I think on balance, the epidemiology now supports a, a case that um, – High high amounts of omega six to omega three are bad. Yeah. So I think he's got to specifically study that. Um, the, the sort of studies on substituting in and out polyunsaturated and monounsaturated and saturated fats just really show nothing. Yeah. Yep. I don't think the benefit not bad, not worse. Uh, but you know they, they suffer from sensitivity problems. But if you specifically look at that ratio, I think that's a thing. And then you start to look at mortality, and you know people talk about that hoofer. Ratio, which is the amount of omega six, I mean, mortality just trends straight upwards and strongly. So, so you know, I think on balance, I would say processed vegetable oils fall into the category of ultra processed food in my mind. So, yeah, and do that's, you know, what I, that's what I. That's where you, yeah, that's where you land, and that's sort of what that's my thinking as well, Grant. Like all of those oils that you mentioned there. I mean, yes, you can pick them up off a sh- some of them you can pick up off the shelf, but ultimately, most people are going to be consuming them in ultra processed food. So if your diet has minimal ultra processed food f- from that aspect, first and foremost, then you are somewhat protected, and then of course, actively seeking out sources of omega threes is the flip yeah. side of that, right? Yeah. So other nutrition things that I've been thinking about, I'd be interested in your feedback because you're, you're way more down the rabbit holes than I am. You know, I've just been thinking about you know, the four or five plausible ways that food can affect your health. Yeah. So I want to talk about this now. The first one is that you just got to get enough energy, enough essential nutrients, and includes protein, essential fatty acids, and micronutrients. Like, like that's the first goal of eating is to get enough of those. If you don't do that, you know, good luck. If, you, if you're getting insufficient energy and insufficient uh, nutrients for growth and development, um, and, and not only that, we're finely tuned. Under normal conditions, we should be finely tuned to that. Like we, we go through puberty, we eat exactly the right amount more to, you know, to, to, to grow the things we need to grow. And same with pregnancy and everything. Like we're so finely tuned for it under normal circumstances. So, so that's, that's the first plausible way. The second, more no, let's just get more nuanced, right? So the net more nuanced thing is that if you can't control your, the sugar and insulin and therefore all of the other hormones in your body, which are affected by food, and, and there's you know, 64 odd hormones, right? But we get down to leptin, the incretin hormones, uh, ghrelin, thyroid, testosterone, estrogen, the list goes on and on, right? Growth hormone. Uh, but those are profoundly affected by the sugar and insulin and first in your blood. If you're insulin resistant, and you're never returning those back to baseline or hardly ever, where you've got massive excursions, then that, that's a, a hugely plausible way that food could affect you. Yeah. Um, the, the third out of the four ways is that um, food can affect a sort of triad of things, inflammation, glycation, and oxidative stress. And they all cause one another. Like high blood glucose causes glycation of of tissues and advanced glycated end products, those themselves are inflammatory. Um, that inflammation itself causes oxidative stress in, in every which way that, that triad works. Um, and foods can cause that both directly, like high insulin glucose causes that, insulin's inflammatory. Um, but you can eat foods, like there's different things you can eat, like uh, trans fats or oxidized vegetable oils or, uh, I don't know, even... Uh, Meat cooked at high temperatures could be glycated, and so that's that's another plausible way that food could affect your body. And the the fourth way I think is that there's other reasons that a normal inflammatory response, a normal immune response, could just go completely off the reservation. Yeah. So you just eat. So some people they eat nightshades or gluten or something, and their body's just like. This is not a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm ki- I'm going to envelop it and kill it and expel it from this here body, um, and that process is highly harmful. That sort of autoimmunity, I suppose. So those are the really the four big things that I've been thinking about. Yeah, nice. And then you go, well, uh, is there a is there a grade of solutions to healthy eating? Then you're know, starting at minimum effective dose and getting harder and harder. And I, I think on that. Provides a framework. The first is ultra-processed food. You just 
you know, start eating actual whole plants and animals, um, and, and that could be good. So that's good. But if you're insulin resistant and you're having difficulties controlling your blood sugar, you might have to watch your starches a bit and reduce that load. Uh, and then actually for some people, even with that, there's some specific thing for some unknown or known reason that they respond badly to, and that has to be identified. Yeah, yeah. And that that's, in my mind, that's the hard part of nutrition, right? There's sort of graded um, levels of involvement here. But actually, if you if you, you'll have to get to the third one, if you've got a if, if you've got an autoimmune problem, you're going to have to do all three. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, and th- that's why it's so much harder for some people than you know other people can just clean up their diet and everything works. Oh, uh, uh, sorry, the one I missed out there is number two, which is before the before the insulin and Glucose and the carb thing is prioritized protein. I, I, I think. I think there's the reality is that uh, and you know this even more than me. But if you, if I study teenagers, if I study older adults, if I study adults, oh my god! I mean, most of them don't even get to the point eight grams per kilo no. a day, let alone twice that, which is where I should think they should be. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously, we are both on the same page with that. Um, a couple of thoughts, Grant, because I think that framework is is such a good starting point. In your first point, when you mention that people should get sufficient energy, that would be a great because the one thing that most people agree on, regardless of whether you are, dare I say, paleo, vegan, carnival, whatever, is that it's the calorie is the biggest toxin in the diet. And eating too many calories, regardless of where they come from, can begin that process of um, not just insulin, well, insulin resistance, I guess, but you know, with everything else sort of going out of whack. So not only is the making sure you get sufficient energy, making sure you don't get too much, but of course, when you talk about ultra processed food, that is obviously going to come into that because people minimise their ultra processed. Food. Like the solution takes care of the calorie as the toxin, yeah. but I reckon that would be yeah. quite good for you to mention. Um, yeah, that's true. And also, I've just been thinking about, you know, insufficient energy is an issue, and and that's why your protein protein sparing modified fast are a bloody good idea because it, it it sort of avoids that major issue of just like oh, I'm not eating today, and yes. uh, and then I'm just going to carry on with that because I feel even better. And you know, so energy, you know, cy- cyclical severe energy in a fit deficiency is also, you know, being a problem. Like that's why we've got yo yo diets. That's what we've got the the set point theory and people undermine their metabolic rate and you know that actually inadvertently you know contributes to weight gain and you know unhappiness and all that sort of stuff as well so you know I, I didn't put that one there just randomly it's like like you've got to get it the body realizing it's got incoming energy and I do do some fasting now and then um, but I, I, you know, wouldn't do that lightly. And I think as you're an aging person, especially a woman, it's, you want to be careful about it. Yeah, for sure. Um, and the other one I wonder, if because it's not food related necessarily, but it totally changes how your body responds to food is, is the stress. Like, and so, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I know that you'll bring that in somewhere, but that I think, um, and probably that will come into the the second one that you're talking about, like blood sugar control and stuff like that, because that's where that sort of directly it's a direct line to impacting on blood sugar control and and hormones yeah like you you have the exact same meal with a poor night's sleep stressed out yes feeling judged uh blah 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 then on another day with all those aren't true yeah i mean it's just a completely different metabolic response isn't it i i I, I think it's the under somehow we've managed to completely miss this point in medicine haven't we about the role of stress um first of all we've at one point, we've gone, oh, stress is bad, when in fact, you know, acute stress is really good. Um, on the other hand, we haven't quite identified that chronic stress is as destructive as it is, you know, at every level. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. And and also um, hydration, you know, like being chronically dehydrated is just a recipe for disaster when it comes to stress. <laughs> yeah. I, I, well, I've been thinking about that. It's interesting you mentioned hydration because I've been thinking about that a lot. Um, and and see, so I've just been actually listening to the latest Peter Atea podcast on that. And he's, of course, well, it's about prostate function, yeah, which is not really going to be in any of it's like me talking. It's like me talking about menstrual cycles. It's no, you know, you're not going to get your head around this, except for, you know, as you age, your prostate enlarges. You know, not that you know that, but, you, know, you need to get up and go to the toilet all the time at night if you 
drink too much. So there's a bit of a drinking control thing there. That's been interesting. Thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But but I but <laughs> I, I you know just back up to the hydration bit. The 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 other point is when you look at horm- if you go through um, Wikipedia, not Wikipedia, and you look at hormesis, right? Yes. And you go through a sort of list of hormetic things, and then you start to follow some of the links, and you get to um, intermittent drinking. We're not talking about booze. No, no, We're no. talking about watering. It's like it's like you know, um, you want to be not chronically dehydrated, but but you know, acute dehydration um, is highly hormetic. Well, so because I I remember someone I hearing someone talk about this. Like, is there any evolutionary advantage to um, being dehydrated? Like, like you know, like what is the what, what what? And so, what what were they talking about with regards to the the positive outcome of that acute dehydration? Well, that's a good question. I was just mulling in my head after I said that. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be interested to, to ask ChatGPT um, about that, actually. But, but, but yeah, 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 I've got to go and look that up. But there's, you know, intermittent drinking is seen as a thing. I'm not saying you want to be chronically dehydrated, <laughs> no. but then you can, you know, mix that up with the... Um, so I'm, I'm not, not convinced that there's... Are people walking around chronically dehydrated? I don't well, know. I, I just wonder, like, so, okay, so because so many people I talk to um, have energy issues, and so instead of drinking enough instead of like instead of thinking hmm am i like thirsty they think they're hungry and they eat like yes yeah, yeah so, but but equally but i understand what you're saying like is it really an issue maybe not maybe i've got a skewed population because people are coming to me because they're low in energy you know like maybe they're a minute sort of percentage of the population like that's how we yeah, inform our I, 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 I mean I, I reckon that thirst is pretty evolutionary well conserved you get thirsty you drink sort of um, Until you hit menopause, and then you lose those signals, or they're dimmed down slightly. Oh yeah, I've got no idea about that. <laughs> so in your book, what you need to do is put like a little reference saying uh, menopause and beyond. Um, uh, check out Lara Bryden, and then like put a little oh, reference yeah, well, to I Lara. Think, I, I, well, I was meaning to get Lara. She was supposed to do a precure thing the other day, but she she got busy and said she couldn't do it. But I just really want to catch up with her with that stuff. She seems to be a bit of a legend in that space. She's an absolute legend, and I edited, helped edit her book f- coming out, um, which is a bit oh, of a nice. claim of fame actually for me. Um, that's all about metabolic health and menopause. So it is. It's a great read, and it's a really accessible read. She's like you. She's so good at being able to translate that information and and for the sort of general audience. That's awesome, except for she's not like me because she knows a whole area that I've got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no insight on whatsoever, you know. Like that's a, that's a real difficulty when you're actually not not of that part of the species, you know. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And actually, I really love the way that you ne- you never profess to know more, like because there are people out there who profess to know more, despite the very obvious fact that they're not actually a woman. Um, not that I'm yeah. saying that men can't know about this stuff, but you know. Oh, I think it's difficult to be honest. I mean, it's just you don't know about prostates. No, true. Actually, yeah, I just yeah. hear what's reported from you know my dad. Yeah. <laughs> Father-in-law, <laughs> husband. <laughs> no, you know. Um, so, Grant. Well, I'm excited for your book. Um, is there anything else before we move on? Because one, I don't want to take all your all your afternoon, but I do want to ask you a couple more things. Uh, is there anything else that you want to share with us about the book before we move on to my other questions? Oh, so the, the one thing I, I was doing sleep as medicine, and I've changed it to light as medicine. I like it, and, but I, like. I, so I don't really go around the my general day. I don't know about you thinking about quantum bio, quantum mechanics and you know quantum physics. I don't know if you do that. Sometimes when I have like I just had a guest last week who is into that because she's into Jack Cruz, and then of course I had Michael Twineman on my show as well, who's very oh, into that field. But I don't think about it daily. It just sort of pops well, up. But it's just so you know, like we're looking around there. There's all this light, and you go, this stuff is it's an incredible thing, right? So. It's got no mass and it's got no charge, but it travels like literally can travel billions of light years, but still confer energy. It's not even a thing, but it moves electrons in atoms, and you know you get photosynthesis all that way. But it's it's astonishing when you look into it how um, humans respond to light um, and those different wavelengths across across the day, and just you know that whole uh, red light, that six eighty nanometer stuff that's in the on the edges of the day and you know, directly affecting mitochondrial, you know, turns ADP into ATP in the mitochondria of the retina. Um, you know, the blue light for mobilizing, you know, T cell lymphocytes and 
obviously the whole vitamin D pathway is an incredible thing, and that's you know basically photosynthetic, isn't it? Uh, and it's just a complete mismatch between light in the sort of modern environment with screens and um, electricity and all that sort of stuff compared to what it was. And you know, that's that. I'm still getting my head around it that there's you know quantum entanglement and quantum coherence and you know, even smelling. The little molecules aren't necessarily fitting things. They're actually these atoms can do a thing called quantum tumbling where they move across you know, completely things that they shouldn't move across and stimulate changes. Yeah, you know, you know, if you understand it, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, holy moly! <laughs> that sounds like when you talk about the sunshine and smelling, I think about nitric oxide. I don't know if that's anything to do with with what you're talking about, but honestly, like that was just so over my pay grade. I'd have no idea. Yeah, so so yeah, that's just a like I'm I'm I think we're underestimating how important light is um, in our life, and I know quite a lot of people are talking about this, but um, yeah, turning it into a practical reality and um, making some gains out of it's interesting. To well, me. do you know, Grant? I know that we think a lot of people are talking about stuff because I often think that about that when I put up my 18th post of the week about how important protein is. How many people are actually engaging or seeing those posts? Like, are we just in this little bubble? Oh, yeah, we're just in our own little Wikipedia just in our, bubble. Yeah, are we, actually? And then everyone else in New Zealand, like, you know, f- the other four and a half million people or whatever just don't don't even think about it. Like, which is why a book like uh, yours is really so, important. At, yeah, uh, especially when we seem to run hospitals and the medical system the way we actually do. Yes. Um. But yeah, I don't know. Like, yeah, that's a good question. That could defeat my whole world. <laughs> no, no, you should feel excited for the opportunity to oh, yeah, put your right, information no, out there. I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, good luck with getting your head around that one. I mean, yeah. the quantum entanglement and the quantum funneling like that <laughs> blows my mind. Um, speaking of blowing my mind, how's Matt Kerr doing? Yeah, so this is um, for guys who people don't know. He's the uh, one of the athletes I coach, who's a, was the age group world champion for the Ironman distance triathlon. And uh, last this time last year, he actually was going to defend that title in Kona, and uh, an old woman stepped out in front of him, and he got completely KO'd at seventy k's now. In fact, when I got there, he thought he had killed the woman. Oh my god, that's right! Because this is the last time we spoke. Was talking about yeah, Matt's and and, and so and then I was sort of. Um, got him back on the bike. This is like at the 178 of the 180k mark, and and I rode with my gravel bike on the course, you know, round with my arm around him, holding him on his bike. You know, he's basically leaning on me. Yeah. And um, and these guys, of course, these are the best, you know, athletes in the world are coming past me at like 60, 70 k's an hour. I'm just going. <laughs> Oh, and I'm just on this funny gravel bike holding this half unconscious guy, oh, and, and and then I end up in the you know in the bike finish shoot of the you know race with my bike, yeah. and all these people running through, <laughs> and I'm like medical, medical. I get into the medical tent, and um, yeah, and I get in there, and we sort of triage the whole thing, and then you know he's like, oh, and then I'm like, oh, I reckon you'd be better off f- finishing this race since you, you know, I've come so far, um. And we'd been in Hawaii for a month before that at a training camp. Incidentally, at that place, Lahaina, which got completely burnt down, which yes. is just devastating. Oh, yes. Um, and uh, so then he sort of ran, stumbled through the marathon, like, you know, pretty much an old guy. Um, and I had to ride my gravel bike somewhere near him without getting disqualified, which actually meant that you could ride down the median strip of the Quenke Highway, which is actually lava. So it's like riding a gravel bike for 40K. You know, on the rocks between Takapuna and Milford Beach, they <laughs> that is insane. Uh, so I don't know who was more gone at the end of that than him or me. <laughs> um, anyway, so no, he's just sort of carried on and um, become a professional athlete, and uh, yeah, never easy. It's just like kind of quantum jump. Yeah, I think he came sixth or fifth at Ironman New Zealand in his first Ironman. He's um, yeah, got all right. He went to Canada, trained up to go to Ironman Canada. But then he's on the plane. He got off the plane. There was an email going, uh, due to bushfires, the whole thing's been cancelled. That's right. So he had to just fly home again the next day. I think he did. Didn't uh, he do like a jog around a botanical gardens or something? Went, what, yeah, yeah, he went for one awesome. run. Yeah. Yeah, one $4,000 run. They, so, and then at the moment, he's going to race this weekend in uh, Ironman 70.3 in Malaysia. Cool. So, 
which seems really hot. Yeah, it looks at looking yeah. at social. Yeah, but but the one I'm most excited about, I coach a young athlete called Amelia Life, who's a 21 year old. Oh, amazing! 20 year old. Yeah. Um, who's a good little runner. Yeah. Um, and you might think this is too young to be in a marathon. She she won Mount Monganui half marathon a year ago. Came second this year, sort of one nineteen. Oh, great! Um, but she's just a friggin' absolute beast. She, she's going to do the Auckland Marathon. I reckon she could do two forty something. So that's oh, cool. That is amazing. It's funny that you yeah. say like um, I might think she's too young. Like you know, I know a girl who her parents are both like um, avid. Uh, trail runners, Sean Collins and Mad Collins. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So their girl, one of their girls, Meg, she just did 100K at Blue Lake. Wow. And, and she's like, what, 20, 21? So I don't know. Like there are, you know, if you recover well, if you train properly, if you fuel well, yeah. why not? Yeah, Amelia did the 50K at the Tarawera. Jeez, nice. Got fourth, oh. uh, first of who was not a pro. Oh, amazing. So that was good. Yeah. Yeah, for a twenty-year-old, that's pretty cool. Awesome, Grant. But, um, also on and what about your own training? <laughs> yeah, no, good. I'm just on my, you know, daily activities. Yeah. As said, I decided that you know be the person you want to be. So I was going to be a runner. Yeah. Again, but yeah. then I got an injury straight away. Yeah, yeah. That's all right. <laughs> that's all right. That's like I said, all part of the process. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And uh, and my last question is. Any particular like favorite foods right now? That's a really good question about favorite foods. I, I, see, I don't even know if this is that good for you, but I'm going to put it out there. Um, well, first of all, I've been. This is a really bad thing for me to say, um, but our, our family eat a lot of food, right? And it's been really costing a lot of money. So I started going to Costco. Yeah, I actually really quite like Costco. Mm, okay, cool. Um, so it's a few good things. Like you get the meat's pretty good quality and not too bad a price. Except for the Wagyu steaks, like, you know, 200 bucks or something. I don't know what that's about. Um, and you get, you know, big lots of eggs and it's, you know, all good price, all that sort of stuff. Um, something really weird about the vegetables here. So I'm not sure if this is good or bad, right? So the vegetables here, there's not much choice. Um, they're in super good condition. They're really yummy. They don't go off. <laughs> Okay, all of that sounded really good until that last one. Well, no, so you get a box of tomatoes from Costco, like yeah. a you know, two kg box yeah. or something. Yeah. And you, or a three kg box, and you're like, shoot, we're getting through this. And a month later, they're still good. Jeez, that's weird, isn't it? <laughs> so I'm not, that, 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 that's an that's, that's interesting thing. But what I've been doing at Costco, and I'm again, not sure if this is a good thing, but you buy these, like, um, basically making my own keto muesli stuff, like shaved almonds and nuts and this salad mix thing that they have, and I've been eating a lot of it, and it's really yummy, but I'm not sure if it's good for you. I suppose I, I, if I'm blunt, um, the scales will tell you whether or not that's a good thing or not. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> well, well, so that's that's the problem for me with protein powder, Mickey. Yeah. Um, as I know a lot of people are big on protein powder, but as soon as I start doing protein powder, weight. Yeah. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Are you still mixing well, it with cream? Is that the problem? No, I, I, that is possibly a problem, but uh, <laughs> no, I don't think that's the major problem. I think yeah. the major problem is that it's just another, it acts like another whole meal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think. It's a bit like those uh, Musashi so, bars, like sort of you, yeah, you those, treat them well, like add-ons, are, those, but actually. Yeah, that's like the time we got um, 300 bucks worth and they <laughs> accidentally sent us another whole 300 bucks worth as well, so we had yeah. 600 bucks worth of Musashi bars. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> 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 the big, real big what size ones, which are yummy, is yeah, totally yeah. are. Yeah, um, well, I mean, Grant, it doesn't sound like too much of a problem, but you know, that is a really good metric to sort of determine that. I love Costco for the reason that they have jalapeno poppers there that you cannot buy anywhere else, like, le- like the ones that you would get in a restaurant that are legitimately like they're the jalapeno poppers, they're cream cheese, and they're covered. These aren't good, obviously, but they're covered. Oh, yeah, with, they're not in the health food Yeah, section. yeah, no, no, God, no. But they're just, at least they're not those little jalapeno bites, which are not actually peppers. So that's what we get at yeah. Costco. And yeah. Oh, I said, actually, I've got a question, another Costco product question for you. Yeah. Mickey Willard and Nutritionist. Yes. Beef jerky. There's big packets of beef jerky. What do you reckon about beef jerky? Yeah, I reckon if you look at the back, because I know there are better quality ones than others, all good. Yeah. Just don't get that Jack Link stuff, which I don't think they sell, but there is. But yeah. I've seen the zero sugar stuff there, and I'm like, you know what? I actually think that's not a bad buy. Yeah. 
I did buy the keto pancakes from there. They were disgusting. Mm. Um, and basically ultra processed food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, you know the other good thing about Costco, not that I need one at this stage, but you can you can buy co- you can buy a coffin at Costco. <laughs> <laughs> can you? <laughs> that is just mental. Well, isn't that mental? Yes. But it makes sense, you know. Yeah. Like, yeah. But you know what is absolute? Like uh, I have real issues with like I don't know if you feel the same as me Grant like when you go to Costco and you see there are families there and they're having dinner because dinner costs a dollar eighty. Oh yeah and yeah yeah the the dollar fifty hot dog <laughs> thing seems like god but like my boys are racing up to dinner and I was like and I don't mean this in a condescending way but I was like guys do you really want to be part of that crowd yeah and, and like it's and they looked at their like, oh, oh. Yeah, it, it's troubling to me because in one, well, like one of my, like part of me thinks, God, these people can't afford to actually eat anywhere else or yeah. at home because legitimately food can actually, like I think it's difficult to sort of sit here and say, yeah, you can eat healthy, it's affordable. I don't know that we can say that right now. Um, no. But so part of me is like, God, at least they're getting eating something. But I'm like, what have we come to that, you know, we've got this, food this loss is obviously like some sort of like loss leader or something for Costco's where they're able to fork out this horrendous food at very cheap money which people just well, want to eat it's funny you mention that because I, I actually woke up in the middle of the night last night and I, I, I if you, you'll indulge me I really want to tell you what I was thinking about yeah. I was thinking about if you made a documentary of like you know the super size me but it was just people went to the only place they ate was Kmart for hot dogs and pizza, what would happen to that? So that's randomly what I woke up and was thinking about last night in oh, the middle of the night. Interesting. Um, which I'd forgotten about until this moment. And someone may have done that. So if anyone knows about that, tell us. But the, I, I, um, I think I, I, I don't imagine it would be good, right? Well, well, you'd think so. But there's, there's one guy who's called the Twinkie Professor, and he ate a diet of absolute processed food. He took a multivitamin. He set his calories at like 1,500, lost weight. So, so it was calorie controlled. <laughs> so, so things like that have been done, actually, actually. Yeah, I can't imagine things like his liver function and. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, and it's short yeah. term, right? Like, so what happens in yeah. two years, three years? Um, one, yeah. one last question, if you indulge me, Grant. Um, so I'm doing Auckland Marathon. Oh, you are. Yeah. So I just came back from Colorado and went. I, how can I make use of this altitude training and all of the time on feet hiking? I'm like, I know, I'll do some six week build to Auckland, right? Oh, awesome. And so at the minute, my VO2 max is 48, according to my Garmin. Oh, nice. Normally it's at like 51 or 52. It goes to 52, but it's normally 51, 52. As much weight as you can put in this, I'm not sure. So, Oh, I reckon they're good. I've done it in the lab and it gave me the same answer as my Garmin. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, amazing. Okay. So, like, I'm thinking. That I can so if I put my five k time into V dot calculator. Oh, now that's that's I think that's problematic. Okay, okay, <laughs> you might have just asked and answered my question. So, so the V dot calculator tells me based on my current five k time, which was before I went to Colorado, that I could do a three seventeen marathon. Yeah, so so I think that's accurate up until a certain point in your running career. <laughs> <laughs> am I just? Am I a bit old? Is that what you're saying? Like, if I was like, well, well I, I don't know if age has got anything to do with it, but yeah, no, I don't. I, I I could be wrong, but I don't. I don't like your chances. Okay, so okay. that's what I'm saying. No, this is good. So, this is this is good. So, so I v dotted Amelia, yeah. and I'm basing everything exactly on that. So I'm not. A, I'm, I'm a fan of the v dot. Uh, For a I younger, more don't. vibrant athlete, is that what you're saying? I think you've. I think you know she's running a hundred and. 20 to 150 k's a week. <laughs> so, so I think under those conditions, it's, you know, and for the triathletes, they're running 80 k's a week, but they're training 25 hours. Yeah, I think, true. I think the V dot's like bang on, right? Yeah. But, um, so take my son Sam, who's a pretty good triathlete, pretty good runner, but he's not really doing, he's doing more like 12 hours a week. The V dot just completely falls to pieces from 5k. Okay. Like he can run a good 5k. Yeah. And I, I, I've been watching you vicariously on Strava and yes. I reckon. Um, while you're running and running reasonably well, you're not doing enough um, miles for the V dot to translate to a marathon. Oh, I think you, know, and you don't you want to be. Yeah, and I actually think you're right too. Like, because I I think about this and I think so. I know what it feels like to run that fast, and I don't. And so I'd really have to dig deep to hurt that much for that long. 
and and I was unsure. This is why I thought I'd bring it to the table and see what your response was. Which, well, I don't want to be negative, no, but no. I think you'd have a better. I, I think you'd have a much better experience at like three thirty. This is what, yeah, yeah. And I'm pleased. And I don't actually. I don't think you're being negative. I think you're being realistic. <laughs> I needed a reality check from that V dot <laughs> thing. So this, which is great actually, because all actually my pacing. So I'm 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 keeping up with the. I'm sort of at a pace probably more around three twenty four to three thirty. If I'm honest, like in my threshold run. So so that's what I'll try and do when I get to uh to Auckland actually. Yeah, it's not actually a, it's not an easy course either. You know, like you can you sort of. I feel you've got to try and coast up the hills in yes. the whole first half of it, and then and then work down them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and people do the exact opposite; they work up them and coast down them. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if you can coast up the hill and conserve some energy, I think that makes a, a big difference in that actual event. Yeah. Okay, this is good advice. And so, so you just the group, whoever you're running with, yeah, let them get ahead of you up the hill. And you know, then crest the hill strongly and catch them down the downhill. It's like the so the way to get to the same place. Yeah. So should I just go out with a three thirty pacer then? Well, I, I well, I don't want to be mean to you. Yeah. No. Talk Is to that me. not going to break your world or something? Oh God, no. No. I like I I actually thought oh I'll do three thirty and then I saw the V dot mean oh okay well maybe I'll do no it. no no you just like they're working that out on you know. Oh, that's a slightly different population than we <laughs> no, no. Now, but, but, but you, I, you I, did one, at one time in your life. You fitted that population. I totally did, and I will forever hang my hat and dine out on on the times that I was amazing. Um, so I think then what I will do is because I think I can easily do five minute k's. Like I think that actually won't be a problem. And if I can just hold on, and then in the last ten k, I'll go for it. Yeah, if you're somehow feeling awesome and yeah. you can pick it up. Yeah. Amazing! Yeah, I see you. Yeah, that, could, that could happen. That could happen. <laughs> you're a little bit less. I, you you don't actually think that'll happen, but I yeah, we'll see. Are you running it, Grant? Well, oh, well, I'm supposed to be doing the, the half, half marathon. Cool. Um, but I, I need to recover from this Achilles injury. Um, but I am training enough to do it. Cool, cool. Can't well, I, I, see, I was I was really fit. Yeah. Um, and I was going to do this half marathon at Mount Monganui. Then I got like COVID quite badly. That's right. And I had to reduce myself to the five k, and yeah, even then I got cramp at the five four point eight k mark. Had to walk it in. <laughs> this doesn't bode well. This doesn't bode well. Just calf hypertrophy, Grant. That's what you need. What's that? Oh, just bigger calves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and actually working on your calves. <laughs> oh yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I want to. Okay, so let's wind this up. Um, this was excellent training advice for me. Excellent life advice. For the listeners and me, um, and just a good general chat. Can you remind people where they can find your insights, Precure, all of that stuff? Oh yeah, so um, Precure.com with a K, Prevention is Cure, um, and then there's also the Future of Medicine site. If you just search for Future of Medicine New Zealand, all the videos are going up there of all the talks for free. That'd be awesome. That'd be so good. Um, and there is a profgrant.com blog site and all that sort of stuff, except for some friggin someone from somewhere in the world hacked it the other day and I can't get on it and I haven't figured out how to got around to fixing it yet you got to get uh, Danny onto that he'll sort that out <laughs> yeah well that's right so so <laughs> <laughs> hey Grant thanks for the chat thanks Mickey that's awesome Alrighty then, hopefully you enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed doing it. It's always a really good opportunity for me to catch up with my mates. And in fact, when I started Wikipedia, that was actually the feedback I got from another one of my friends. Mickey, you're just able to just, you're using it as an excuse just to uh, chat to your friends. And to be fair, that is true. But I also get to chat to some of the experts in their field of inquiry. And with that in mind, next week on the podcast, I get to talk to someone who has been a mentor from afar for several years now, Dr. Jade Teeter. So I'm looking forward to bringing that conversation to you next week. Until then, though, you can catch me over on Instagram, Twitter, and threads at Mickey Willardin, Facebook at Mickey Willardin Nutrition, or head to my website, mickeywillardin.com. You can send an inquiry there. All right, team, you have a great day. See you soon.